Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Michelle Berry. Um, I'm the director of the Center for Innovation in Global Health and the Senior Associate Dean here for Global Health. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody, especially our guests. Um, we're pleased to be co-hosting this event with the, our colleagues at the Honda Center. We have two very special people this evening that are going to speak to us about the conditions and humanitarian response inside, inside Syria um, for the millions who have been internally displaced and whose narratives have not really been addressed in the media. I'm pleased to introduce Secretary Jan Egland, Secretary General of the Norwegian Refugee Council. Um, Secretary Egland has dedicated his career um, to helping people who have been persecuted since I gather since age 19. Um, as UN Undersecretary General and Emergency Relief Coordinator between the years of 2003 and 2006, Jan led international efforts to streamline relief in large-scale acute crises. In this role, he developed 2005 UN reform of the humanitarian system, and in 2006, uh, Time magazine named him one of the 100 people who shape our world. That's quite a, that's quite a nomaker. Um, Jan later became, became director of the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs, and we all know how progressive the Norwegians are before assuming the position of European Director at Human Rights Watch. He has held his, his current position as Secretary General of the Norwegian Refugee Council since 2013. Our second speaker, welcome, is Dr. Frida. I always like to see gender balance on our speakers. She's an extraordinary humanitarian physician and one of the last OBGYNs that are still active in Syria. She works with the Syrian American Medical Society, a non-political, non-profit medical relief organization that is working on the front lines of crisis relief in Syria and neighboring countries to save lives. We're very pleased to have other representatives of SAMS here, um, and I'm going to invite Dr. Masan Alahariri of SAMS, um, Board of Directors, to actually give us a little bit of background about SAMS before I ask Dr. Eglin to start off the conference. My name is Mayan Hariri. Uh, I'm an internal medicine physician. Um, I work with the Permanente Medical Group, uh, Santa Clara. Um, I am also a board member of SAMS, uh, Syrian American Medical Society. In addition to being an educational uh, medical society, SAM is also a nonprofit, non religious uh, humanitarian medical relief organization. Most of its work still in Syria, although it has now expanded to work globally to help uh, other countries in need. In Syria, uh, we initially started helping people on the ground physically and through online communication. Our main um, online communication method was actually Skype, where um, our internists and surgeons here were helping people through Skype even perform surgeries. Um, it was primarily focused on trauma and war injuries. Uh, then we've established um, mobile clinics for urgent cares as well as chronic conditions. We were providing medications and um, basically equipment and helping them again um, online to perform their work and to report data. Um, soon after, we've advanced to building underground hospitals and staffing them and now we are even adding a focus on the rebuilding process uh, by establishing healthcare and medical educational system in Syria. In 2016 alone, as you see here on the slide, uh, we actually treated about 3 million patients, performed 100,000 surgeries, and delivered 40,000 babies. So um, in addition to our relief mission, we also carry an intense humanitarian advocacy work. 
So um, I just want to say that um, it's said that heroes are made by a path they choose and not the power they are graced with. And this is really applied a lot to Dr. Farida here today. Um, she's our guest speaker, of course, and um, as previously introduced, um, she's obstetrician from Syria, and she was the last female physician to leave besieged Aleppo last year. She worked under extremely difficult conditions with no electricity, and she even had to deliver and babies as well as do C-section um, under aerial bombardment and uh, very, very difficult um, you know, health um, and serious conditions. So uh, today she will be talking about the status in Syria and also um, as long, <laughs> also uh, I think Mr. Yan, I should say, right? Mr. Mm -hmm. Yan England will be also um, speaking to us about the humanitarian crises um, happening in Syria um, as well as hopefully some way to help out. Thank you. Thank you. So friends, it's an honor to be with Dr. Dr. Farida here and, and friends from SAMS. Uh, I'm here also with the yeah, Consul General of Norway and colleagues from Norwegian Refugee Council. Uh, Joel uh, is down there and uh, he's our uh, Washington DC representative and Bear here is the board uh, chair of the uh, Norwegian Refugee Council, which is also now established as the first uh, uh, Scandinavian uh, humanitarian organization in, in America. Which brings me also to uh, the Bay Area. Uh, so the Norwegian Refugee Council is one of the largest organizations in the world working for the displaced, those who are displaced by conflict, either within their country, internally displaced, or refugees. We work in 30 different countries, uh, all of them in war, strife, conflict. Um, we have 12,000 field uh, uh, staff, workers, and we, we helped more than th uh, 6 million refugees and displaced last year. This year we need to reach many more. Indeed, Syria is one of the countries where, 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 we, where we are working. Uh, but let me, as, as background to all of this, uh, show you how the number of refugees and, conf uh, and internally displaced due to conflict has evolved over the years. We, we and, and NRC, together with UNHCR, the High Commission of Refugees, is, 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 is estimating the numbers. And you would see, I mean, if, you, if you're a student at Stanford, uh, chances are that you were born in the beginning of the 1990s, mid-1990s. That was, in a way, the the previous comparable period to the one we're living through today. That was the age of the genocides uh, in, uh, in, in the Balkans and in Rwanda and so on. Very many people were killed and some er erected 45 million refugees <coughs> and internally displaced worldwide. Then it went down because the Cold War was ebbing out uh, after, after, after uh, all of the post-Cold War wars of the beginning of the 90s. And it was relatively stable around 40 to 35 million until 2012. And what happened? The number of refugees in this place in the world went through the roof, really. Up now to more than 65 million refugees and internment space in the world. Why this dramatic thing since the 2012? Well, the number one explanatory fact is the war in Syria. It is a displacement crisis like none we've seen since the aftermath of the Second World War. The many reasons that Syria became as bad as it, uh, as, as it became, um, uh, but, but really it's, it's unique in the number of families that had to flee their homes. Altogether, I mean, the, the figures are, are staggering, 
1.3 million now refugees within their own country and turn it displaced. Another 7.2 million that are in need of humanitarian assistance. On top of that, more than 5 million registered refugees in the neighboring countries. More, as a, uh, as a friend here from Turkey also observed, on top of the registered refugees, there are many other Syrians, Turkey, Jordan, um, uh, Lebanon especially. But the, the, the number then of people either displaced or in need of assistance is staggering, 18.7 million out of a pre-war population on, of around 23 million uh, of various estimates. Again, we haven't seen such a devastation of an ancient civilization in this generation. So this is the background for the international efforts uh, to help this um, uh, people that have been devastated by conflict, uh, in part by, by the, the, the making of Syrians themselves, but to a large extent by others coming with fuel to this fire. Uh, again, uh, uh, tr trying to give now an overview before we will also have a discussion here, so we won't speak very long. Uh, I, any of us, I understand, uh, will discuss. The displacement what has actually happened across the nation. The, these yellow circles are places to from um, uh, to, to to where people have fled. So people have fled to um, <coughs> to um, uh, certainly to Damascus, to the uh, Homs uh, Hama region, to Idlib, to Aleppo also fled from these regions uh, and and uh, these the, the blue are the, the top um, places from where people fled of late this is uh, 2017 so this is the latest di displacement figures only I, I should say that uh, from the regions where the fighting has been the hardest of late including Araka shows that uh, uh, there's been displacement that we have tried to help alleviate with our 3,000 relief workers in Syria and the neighboring countries, NRC. The displacements have continue, been continuous actually since, uh, since 2012 until today. And the last few months have been among the worst in terms of fighting and displacement. Uh, there is a large humanitarian operation in, in Syria. I mean, it, there, is a, there is, I work also on Yemen, on North Nigeria. I was just in North Nigeria last week. Uh, and, and nearly as many people, as many people are actually in need in Yemen as they are in Syria. Uh, fewer are displaced. There, there are uh, 8 million people also in, in Nigeria. And there are smaller humanitarian operations. But, the, there, there has always been a tremendous gap between this is the number of people affected in, in millions uh, it's, uh, proportions since 2012 and this uh, this is the line of resources available that's what we call the funding gap then what has since uh, 2013, been diminishing amount of uh, funding available for all of us, including SAMS and, 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 and NRC and the UN and everybody, compared to the people in need. I mentioned, you know, more than 18 million altogether uh, uh, refugees and turned displaced and other war, war victims. And the, the funding uh, status for, for this year is that of the enormous total appeal from all of the organizations working um, in or, or with the UN and, uh, and other international organizations is, is that we have uh, 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 less than 40% funded. One of the reasons it became so horrific is this 
proxy war. Um, throughout uh, the conflict, there were international actors uh, fueling the fire. Uh, Russia not only not only assisting the the government uh, as the Assad government, but also bombing. Uh, alongside the government. Iran with a, a massive uh, military forces on the ground. Iraq also with uh, militias uh, on, on uh, Hezbollah, etc., fighting on the government side. And then the Gulf countries, Saudi Arabia and others, uh, assisting an, a growing number of, uh, of opposition uh, armed groups. In the end, very many of them, and, 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 and uh, so moderate, some extremists, uh, and also uh, some organizations that were designated as terrorists, uh, um, the Islamic State fighters, uh, uh, number one of them. So um, uh, the, the, this has meant really that Syria has become a place where others fight their wars, in a way, to the last Syria. Um, how has the uh, the front lines e evolved? Well, a lot. I mean, this is uh, this is um, actually uh, from uh, uh, over the last two years, 2016, 2017. You, the, the red is actually areas controlled by the Syrian government. The um, the uh, uh, the black, what uh, controlled by the Islamic uh, State, ISIL. Uh, the yellow, Kurdish. Um, uh, the the, the uh, greenish other other rebel uh, forces. Uh, to make it qu quick, but as you will see, little by little, uh, things happen. First, Islamic State taking a lot of territory, uh, and then in the end, uh, uh, Kurdish and government forces, especially government forces taking much more territory. Has this meant uh, less suffering? No, it has meant continued suffering, but where some areas had less war, uh, it became calm, but the, uh, the, war, uh, the war went elsewhere. One thing that is interesting to discuss and study for academics here is the whole issue of the high cost of warfare against so-called designated terrorist groups. Uh, the, the BBC journalist who came first into Raqqa had a very good comment, uh, really. Um, so Islamic State fighters had, after this fierce war, uh, you know, uh, been, been, been defeated. They had a little, little uh, uh, portion left. But his answer was, was it really, really necessary to destroy and depopulate the city to liberate uh, and save it. <coughs> this, so much of the same is now happening in, in, in Dega, so and so on. Of course, uh, of course, the cost of, I, I'm sure, sure you will talk about that, of the Farida, uh, the cost of the civilian population in a place like Aleppo was tremendous. So uh, I think, uh, as humanitarians, of course, you know we have two big aims. One is to assist people. Physically, it's a system help 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 uh, save their lives. Uh, it could be medical. It could be like we do shelter, uh, food, water, sanitation, etc. But there is also a protection element, and the protection crisis, in my view, has been in a way much even much stronger in Syria than in in than the assistance crisis. In, 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 in Yemen, there is actually now uh, millions uh, engulfed with hunger, not in Syria. In Syria, it's been more than anything a protection crisis. This, uh, this, uh, I mean, the, this girl, uh, seven years, with responsibility for her, her brother, two and a half years, she doesn't first and foremost need another blanket. She needs protection against the, the people bombing uh, constantly. And we were never able to provide that. I mean, the international community were never able really to protect the civilian population. It was a, it was a, a, a big, uh, a big uh, 
op operation that reached millions of people. But you know, you say, you, we save people today to see them hit uh, tomorrow. Negotiating humanitarian access to to um, to the conflict zones have been a nightmare in uh, in uh, in Syria because the armed actors have denied uh, access. Uh, uh, the government has has been the the one that has done most of the besiegement and most of the uh, of, of the blocking to many of these areas, but many other groups have also done that. And certainly in the Islamic State held areas, there was limited or no access to, to millions uh, millions of, of, uh, of people. Well, uh, negotiating humanitarian access is something I've tried to help with in the UN. This morning I was on a phone call actually with um, SAMS leadership and uh, the Union of Medical... Uh, okay. you, you and uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's another very good uh, uh, NGO on the medical side, uh, the union. Uh, Yusam? Uh -huh. Yusam? Yeah, Yusam, yeah. And, um, and we had on the call Russians, uh, uh, the UN in Damascus, uh, the UN in Gaziantep, everybody, World Health Organization, SAMS, etc., to try to plan a medical evacuation of 400 patients from Eastern Ghouta, which are besieged areas next to Damascus. It's just east of Damascus. I mean, it's like, uh, like uh, Palo Alto being besieged, and we, and, and we try to get people from here into, in, in, uh, into uh, a hospital in, in, in San Francisco. And we cannot do it because there is uh, the armed actors deny us. <laughs> Hopefully, we will have, have success. Now, um, Okay, this, uh, the, the, what we have is, um, uh, <coughs> it's a complicated map, but it also, it also in a way shows the two ways we reach millions. We also reach millions in Syria. Either by cross-border, all of these border crossings exist, these border from, from, from Turkey, from uh, Iraq, from Jordan, uh, from Lebanon. Most of the border crossings have been blocked throughout the war on one side or the other, either by the neighbor or by the armed actor inside Syria. Still millions have gotten assistance cross-border. Uh, my organization has done a lot of cross-border. It's been seen as illegal by the government of Syria. The other one is cross line from inside, I mean from Damascus or, or now also from Aleppo, trying to go across the front lines from within. So it's either cross front line from within or cross border directly into, uh, into, um, into uh, oppositional ter ter territories. It particularly difficult has been the besieged areas. What is a besieged area? It's a place that is military encircled with the armed actor denying both humanitarian assistance in and civilian uh, movement in and out for at least three months. That's the UN uh, definition of, of, of besiegement. East Aleppo was besieged during a horrible period and it was also attacked rel relentlessly. So has uh, uh, Yarmoukbin, which is, in a way, it's like a neighborhood on the outside of, of, of Damascus now, but it started up as a refugee camp for Palestinians that fled, uh, fled uh, uh, Israel, Palestine, in 1948 and 1967. So these are the if you like, the grandchildren of refugees. There have been Palestinian refugees throughout, and they have been, there's been relentless fighting there, and the place looks like this now. This is actually, it's worse now. This was one of the few times it was possible to really get people out in 2015, go back to 15 now. Okay. Besieged areas have had up to a mi uh, more than a million people. Now it's half a million. 
East Aleppo is not uh, anymore besieged. Uh, Deir ez Zour was uh, besieged by Islamic State, not so anymore. Still half a million people living in, in besieged areas. Besiegement like that belongs in the Middle Ages. Uh, it was used during the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, the, the, the purpose of the, of the besiegement is to, in a way, starve out those who are your enemies, fighters in, inside. The consequence is that you are uh, doing war crimes because you also starve out the civilian population in, in the area. Uh, let me um, come uh, to an end. Uh, yeah, there, there, are, there, there is a combination here of, uh, I mean, I don't know how, how good your eyesight is, some, uh, but there are some young people here, so they may <laughs> actually be able to see these, all these dots are um, population areas that are um, hard to reach, which means that there is only sporadic help to these areas. Um, sporadic help. And then the ones with red, uh, especially here, 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 these are the two only areas now besieged by rebel groups uh, or, or, or armed opposition groups. Uh, these are two Shia villages called Fu and Kefraya. Most are besieged by the government forces. Still besieged. Concentrated to these areas. But then large areas, especially those held by the Islamic State fighters, uh, other uh, sort of crossfire areas have been consistently sort of hard to reach. And let, let me end. I mean, What's the solution to this uh, nightmare? It's, oh, there's only political solutions. There is, uh, it's, it's a good maxim for our work to say there are no humanitarian solutions to humanitarian problems. There are political negotiated solutions to humanitarian problems. This is, uh, this is the uh, UN mediator, Stefan de Mistura. Impossible job. Uh, I am his uh, advisor on humanitarian issues, uh, and I, I, I do this negotiation on humanitarian access. At the moment, the whole thing is in the hands of uh, Russia, Iran, Turkey, which are, are, are the strongest, if you like, on, on the ground, and also uh, uh, US, Saudi Arabia, and so on, who has been helping aiding on the opposition side, and the jury is out whether, whether they will pull together towards a negotiated solution or not. So far, there's not been a willingness for that. So that's my introduction. Uh, I'll give a minute over to Dr. Darida. inside Idlib now. But before that, I was working inside uh, Aleppo. Um, maybe some of you heard about Aleppo, the besiegement in, in Aleppo. Uh, East Aleppo. So, uh, maybe uh, you know something about Aleppo. Uh, the regime and its allies uh, have encircled uh, the city and uh, start attack the city a heavy attack heavy bombardment he killed <coughs> everything he killed the people he killed the animals he uh, he attacked the hospitals he attacked uh, schools he attacked the markets and one day my daughter was at the school when they attacked her school many times i was at the hospital they attacked the hospital i was working inside and there is the. Uh, this is uh, this is some photos from inside Aleppo. The photo on the on the right side 
is uh, that one is in one uh, in school that was on a school and there was many children had died and also the teachers of them and many of the teachers had uh, their head, head cut off the the, the photo was uh, horrifying it's make me uh, can't sleep for days and also the other photo of the of one of the hospital the last remaining hospital in Aleppo uh, at the last uh, few days, uh, at, the at the besiegement of the city of Aleppo, there was no other hospitals working inside the city. So just the hospital was working there. And uh, also for me as an OBGYN, there was uh, no one working there, just me and another doctor, male doctor. And this is uh, some babies which we uh, help in birthing them inside the city of Aleppo. But uh, I will uh, talk about my hospital. My hospital was uh, called in uh, called uh, M2 or Omar bin Abdul Aziz. I uh, make many surgeries there. Sometimes uh, the number reached uh, 15 cesarean section per day, and also there is the normal deliveries. The number was huge in our hospital. But uh, the regime and its allies had attacked the hospital many, many, many times. So we had to move to another hospital underground. So when we uh, moved to underground, uh, this photos from my hospital it had been attacked, and this is the ambulances of my hospital, the first one. Then we had to move to another hospital underground for my safety and for the safety of my patients. And uh, it was a fortified hospital, and it was underground, so we, uh, the regime couldn't uh, attack it and they uh, dis uh, they tried to destroy it many times but they failed so they smoked us with chlorine gas uh, we were there and we were making some operations and there was uh, the first chlorine attack and then the, uh, and there was no oxygen there was just one bottle of oxygen we had to make the the mask of oxygen between the children there and after two days there was another uh, chlorine attack at the hospital the same hospital i was working inside and there was a patient uh, at, the, at the operation room. I, we had to to turn the, the to take the patient to, with us to the uh, to the other hospital in Aleppo, and there was just one hospital remaining at that day. It was uh, like nightmare when I remember that days. Uh, so uh, now in uh, Syria and especially in Idlib. The number of people there who with IDPs, I'm, I'm one of that IDPs, uh, there is a huge number of people there, about four millions. But the doctors, the number of doctors and medical staff is that it's not enough for, the, for all, all of these people. If I can give you just a number of uh, doctors, maybe here in America the number of doctors for each uh, 10,000 population is about 30. But for us in Idlib, it's just two or less. And the number is gradually decreasing because some doctors prefer to go out. Some of them can't tolerate that heavy bombardment. Some of them are afraid for their families. So most of them will escape just to go to Gulf or just to go to Turkey. And many of my friends, uh, my friend, there's no, no any friend of me of, uh, who, was, uh, who was with me with, in the university. I uh, don't find any friend of me uh, with me uh, now in Idlib. Uh, so uh, now the number is horrifying of the doctors and medical staff in uh, Idlib. Now we are trying uh, to uh, make uh, or now we made, we uh, made a medical school in Idlib and in Aleppo just to have more doctors. Uh, this is a photo of uh, training school uh, when I was training uh, that uh, uh, midwives to uh, be a good midwife. <coughs> we uh, make them, we uh, give them certification and uh, experience in the hospital. And the other, host, and the other one is uh, that uh, people, some of the people that had been uh, displaced from Aleppo to Idlib. And there is many people now in Idlib in camps. Most of them don't have houses. Most of them don't have schools. Most of the uh, children. For my my daughter, she had no 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 school. So I had to put her in a private school, and it's a bad one. 
this is some uh, children in hospitals of Idlib now. The attacks is, didn't uh, stop. It's continue until now. And maybe some of you have heard about Dr. Uh, Ali Darwish, who had been attacked in a uh, in sarin gas and he had died. And there is Dr. Hassan Al Araj, uh, previous before that, uh, died in uh, Syria. That was in Khan Shikhun, where Dr. Ali Darwish had died. So now we were, uh, we are now with uh, trying to uh, train uh, doctors or newly graduated doctors and midwives and nurses because the, the number of midwives in Syria is not that number which helped most of the women to have a good delivery at a good center because the hospitals uh, there is just small centers, not that big centers, and it just gives the necessities for women. There is just we help we just help them in, in, in short term uh, uh, life saving procedures. We didn't help them in uh, like chronic diseases, in women health uh, care, in uh, like cancer screening tests. We uh, we don't have all of that because we don't have equipment and we don't have uh, skilled uh, technicians or doctors because the number of doctors is not enough for all that population. Uh, I speak about myself. Sometimes when I heard about a uh, new technique or new surgery, I don't have anyone to uh, teach me how to do that. So I open on uh, YouTube. I learn many things about from YouTube. So uh, the doctors inside Syria, they, they uh, learn from YouTube. And many of them learn from telemedicine. And that's uh, very helpful. So we, we, it's uh, very good for us as doctors, for me and for us, just via telemedicine and YouTube. And when uh, anyone has no doctor or professor from out of Syria, he can call him uh, via Skype and just talk about that operation. <coughs> so they can help uh, him, they can help uh, each other during the procedure in the operation room. As uh, you know, there is Dr. David Knott and Dr. Samir Al-Attar uh, before that uh, 2015. Uh, doctor, many doctors had entered Syria to uh, help uh, doctors in uh, new uh, surgi surgical techniques. And this is the photo from uh, one of the, uh, of the uh, procedures. It was uh, maxillary uh, reconstruction. reconstruction operation in uh, besieged Aleppo during the besiegement. And the other was, and the other photos now is uh, that we were with Sam's establishing uh, cave hospitals because we, do, we don't feel uh, safety on the uh, overground hospitals like uh, many hospitals inside Idlib. So now we are uh, establishing many hospitals or fortifying the hospitals that ch which is uh, over the ground. Uh, and this dog is uh, the card on the door of the hospital. It's rocky. Uh, in uh, Syria or in Aleppo, we had witnessed many atrocities against the humanity. And now we are trying to do our best uh, to help that people. And, uh, you know, maybe you can help us in with your science, with your uh, skills. So we need that inside Syria. The, because there is many doctors, newly graduated doctors or medical students, they need books, they need lectures, they need to be uh, learned about telemedicine. So uh, for me, uh, <coughs> maybe I have some experience, so I can help many doctors and residents in OBGYN. There is many residents with me in the hospital, I can help them. And there is uh, many trainees uh, in a midwife school. I can help them at the midwife school. Uh, but uh, like uh, what happened in Aleppo, it's happening now in East Ghouta, Eastern Ghouta. It's crime. It's besiegement. There is no humanitarian access. Many children have died. There is uh, many cases of malnutrition. And malnutrition, we, uh, we saw it before that, we witnessed it in Aleppo. Many women, uh, breastfeeding women, pregnant women, I saw them with hemoglobin was just uh, six. 
So we, we, we had just to uh, make transfusion because she can't eat. She, she, there is no meat. There is no veg vegetables. She just have to eat the thrills. And it's not enough for a, pa for a patient with uh, anemia, with severe anemia. And that's what's happening now in Eastern Ghouta. And I think it's uh, the beginning of uh, the regime uh, just to take uh, Eastern Ghouta and just to send people to Idlib from Eastern Ghouta. It, it will be a, a very big deal for the refugees now. There will be a big number of new refugees and they need humanitarian convoy. They need uh, medical help. They need everything. Like me, when I get out of Aleppo, I, I don't have anything. I don't have house, I don't have food. So, so I, I, I was there like a stranger. I, I, I'm in Idlib now, just a stranger. I, I started a new life, but it's not like uh, the life before that in my uh, country. Now everyone feel uh, like stranger, not in his house. So we uh, just, I think, uh, you as in uh, a big uh, university like Stanford, you can help us in your with your science. You can help us inside Syria. I know it's uh, it's not uh, you can't enter Syria because it's uh, very hard for the border lines. But you can help us. You can help doctors in hospitals inside Turkey, right? Like in Al Amal Hospital, in Rehanli. There is many doctors had uh, entered <coughs> inside Turkey and help doctors from inside Syria. They send them to that hospital to, uh, to teach them the new techniques in surgeries and uh, the up-to-date uh, new surgeries. So we, uh, we just want you to help us in that. <coughs> So I think uh, my presence here, I, I, I appreciate uh, that you <coughs> my attendance here in your university and uh, I just want you to help us inside Syria, not just with uh, money, we just want to help in science because it's very important for us <coughs> and uh, our religion as Muslims has uh, told us to help people. In everywhere, in uh, inside Syria or inside any other place, to help humanity. For so, uh, whenever I see a woman need help, I have to help. <coughs> so I, I didn't escape from my city. I I get back to Syria. I'm going back to Syria, and especially to Idlib, to help people and to help uh, mid, uh, the midwives in uh, midwife school and help uh, resident doctors to be uh, better doctors. Thank you. Thank you.